I have created my own tier list for Watcher of Realms. This is up to date as of the start of January 2023, but before we begin I would like to first go over the ratings in the top right, so if, if you do plan to skip forward just one second please. The rating system does not mean bad halfway down, everything does not need to be S or A in this tier list. The goal of this tier list is to show a more staggered perspective from S all the way down to E, and the ratings in the top right covers exactly what that means. So here is the full tier list. I'll show you just the full blow up if you just want to grab that and run off now. And we're going to go through this tier list one tier at a time, working all the way from star all the way up to S tier. So let's get started. So we will start with the star tier. The star tier is a special tier that I added. What this means is that they are incredibly niche specific heroes. They are there to fulfill a particular role in a team, usually for a given piece of content or raid. These heroes are typically best for late game players, but some of them are useful early game. So please do not assume that this means that they are just bad heroes. They are very good, but they are reserved for certain areas. So as you can see, the first one on the star tier is Cerberus. I was originally going to put Cerberus on E tier because pretty much everyone I know has not had a lot of joy out of him. However, more people are starting to play with him a bit more and get more use out of him. I've heard that Cerberus does have some very good usage in Arena. I've heard he's very good in Tide and he can provide some decent damage in Gear Raid 1. The reason he is on a star tier and not on the ranked tier list is because he is just so niche in how he is played and how he is used and how you figure out his placements. And Cerberus is a great 9th or 10th hero to have if you're not using those for Lord slots because he can just be placed down to get some extra damage and then die and that's kind of okay. If you're very early game and you can't get full potential out of him, he would probably be in the E tier. Gwendolyn is the new Christmas limited healer for the North faction. You cannot get her anymore, unfortunately. She was only available for, I think, a two-week period over Christmas. And she is the only the second legendary healer in the game. I do have her. I pulled her four times. She is very niche, very interesting. A lot of people think she is awful. I did a review video on her where I didn't rate her too well. However, the stipulation is that she is incredible in Gear Raid 2, specifically stages 19 onwards. Having her makes it significantly easier. Without her, you need a whole host of other heroes to make that work. Her Awakening 3, which is this one, means that her Icy Shell will give the full shield to everyone around. Typically, it's 90% of her max HP on one target within her range and 45% to the adjacent target uh, to the adjacent allies. With Awakening 3, the target and all adjacent allies get the full 90% of Gwendolyn's max HP as a shield, which makes her incredibly potent at dealing with Gear Raid 2's massive area damage. I believe that pretty much any future content where there is massive damage coming in, Gwendolyn will be very useful there as well. I think she is probably the... She probably epitomizes what the star tier is for. She is fantastic in a specific area, but to put her at A tier or S tier would be very misleading to newer players who would build her and find her not very useful in a lot of content. Next up, we have another healer, an epic one this time, Dolores. Dolores is in the star tier purely because she is a late game character. She is actually quite useful in a few areas. She is one of the best heroes in the game for guild boss, mainly because of her ultimate, which boosts the attack of allies, which is incredibly powerful to have a booster in the game. Her awakenings also massively increase allies' attack and increases her healing and allows her to get her ultimate up sooner. So generally just a very strong core hero, but her healing output is very weak. It is incredibly low, her basic heal. It's only 10% of her attack per second, and she's an epic hero, so her base attack is quite low. I have a whole video covering Dolores that you may want to check out if you're looking on how to build her and where to use her specifically. If you are late game, she could easily be bumped up to perhaps be here just by how powerful she is in Guild Boss as well as in Gear Raid 1, which I think is becoming quite important and perhaps more important than Guild Boss at this stage. Next, we have another healer. This time it is Lily, belonging to the Piercer faction. She was a fairly new addition, only added a few months ago. Mainly the reason she is a niche hero that has actually got some decent usage is her Fawny Protection passive, which allows her to make an ally immune to one fatal attack that can trigger every 60 to 55 seconds on skill up. So she has the ability to save a hero, which is incredibly powerful. I don't really know any other hero that can do this for allies, uh, give them an actual fatal save. So that's incredibly niche, incredibly powerful and very specialized. At the moment that can be used in Gear Raid 2, 19 onwards again, in conjunction with heroes like Gwendolyn and Regulus, that can be very powerful, may help your run succeed. The reason why I rate this kind of stuff is although at the moment we don't have a lot of content that requires that, in future we may do and there is no one else that offers this. So I think Lily is definitely a very interesting hero that has a lot of potential in future content. Next up we have Dallin. She belongs to the Watcher faction. She is a fighter. She was previously a ranger, which was a sixth type of class, but they removed it and made them all fighters. 
What made Rangers unique was that they had the ability to generate cost for you to allow you to place heroes faster. She has been made a fighter now, but she still continues to keep her passive. Rebel, every 30 seconds, recovers 13 points of cost for the team. This is really good, especially because her cost is 11. And keep in mind, if you despawn a hero, I believe you get half their cost back. So she is just there for her passive. You don't need to build her. I, you could if you want to, if you have the resources, but it's not really what she's there for. Her basic attack doesn't really do anything interesting, and her ult isn't especially strong either. She is really just here for her passive rebel to help you get teams out faster. I use this in Gear Raid 1, I use this in Gear Raid 2. Next up we have Mary. Uh, if you're confused by her appearance, she does have white hair for some reason when she, when she gets promoted. She is an AoE mage that focuses entirely on control. So as you can see, she has a lot of ways of slowing down enemies and CCing and freezing them in place. Her damage is very low. She is not really going to kill anything for you. She is actually quite a good early game and she is a hero you get, I believe, on your 7-day login as a new account. I could be wrong. Next up, we have Laurel, a fairly new, newly introduced hero. She is a mage belonging to the Esotericist faction. Her damage output is pretty low, but the reason that she is used, her passive symbiotic power, whenever an ally releases an ultimate skill, she casts damage increase on them, which boosts their damage by 10%, 20% if you have her max skilled. A 9 second 20% damage boost for any ally that uses their ultimate. This is very nice. They don't need to be within her attack range as well. She will just fire it across the map. So I use her, just tuck her in the corner to get ultimates out stronger. I find her very useful in Gear Raid 1. Aatrox is a fighter for the Curse faction. He is very unique because he has only 7 costs to deploy, but more importantly his revival time is 20 seconds. He is up 3 times faster than other heroes by default, which is a very fast respawn. You may wonder why you want a hero whose goal is to die and respawn. There is some content in the game, namely Gear Raid 2, where there are rolling boulders that do massive damage, but they also take damage upon hit. Using someone like Aatrox is very nice just to help tank the boulders, make them whittle away their health quickly. So yeah, Aatrox is quite interesting, quite a niche hero, and I think he definitely belongs in the star tier. You, If you want a fighter, there are definitely better epic fighters out there for general content. He is going to be particularly good in very weird niche content, but keep an eye on him. Now after that we have some rare heroes. There are other rare heroes that you can consider in this game. It's, I just wanted to keep it limited mainly to legendary and epic heroes. These ones get honorable mentions because they are all faction lords. We have Bora, who belongs to the Watcher faction. Dagna is the rare lord for the North faction. And we have Nero, who is the faction lord for the Cursed Cult. Again, 5% stat boost for allied faction members. And also, he grants 15% more damage to slowed, stunned, frozen, and immobilized enemies. I actually really like Nero's benefit. The reason to use rare faction laws is entirely just for that. You don't really want to build them. You don't want to place them. Now, moving on to the E tier. These are heroes that you just don't want to build. It's a waste of resources, to be honest with you. We really want these heroes to be rebalanced. Some of these may be used by players late game and they may have some success. So we'll go over them mainly just so I can, you know, trash talk them. So we have Damon. He has no awakenings, which sucks. He belongs to no faction, which sucks. He is a fighter and his skills don't really do a great deal. My belief is they're going to be adding some kind of vampire faction in future and they'll probably make Volker a lord of that faction or something like that and they'll double faction heroes like Volker and Nyx because they've now added a bunch in Selene as well. They all seem to be these kind of vampiric characters and you can see this elf prince has become a vampire so and is loyal to Volker. So I'm pretty sure in some point they'll be adding a vampire faction so maybe he's one to watch in future. I just want to iterate this. Please don't scrap these heroes just because I say they're crap. They are going to get changed. Things are going to happen. It's never scrap epic heroes. It's unless you have dupes of them or you've max awakened them or something like that. Don't scrap stuff just because it's bad now. These games get updates a lot and we are already seeing quite a few changes. And we'll move on to Cyclone. He is arguably the worst epic hero in the entire game. Again, no faction, no awakenings, no talent. 16 cost, 60 revival time. He is pretty widely regarded as the worst epic in the game. He just doesn't really have a lot going for him. However, if you do check the gallery and go to the bottom, there is the Elemental Fission. The faction is not yet available. So I'm pretty certain they are going to be putting Cyclone in that faction. Moving on next, we have Titus. He is a defender for the Infernal faction. He actually does have Awakenings for once. The reason he is down in E tier is because generally defenders are not as good in this game, in my opinion. You typically only need to build one defender through most content. And by the time you get to end game content, you only need two defenders. I've never really heard of a content area where you need three defenders or more. So when you only need to build one to two defenders throughout the entire game, and even then you will not need to six star them until very late, Titus just doesn't really cut it. 
He has some very niche things. He gets some temporary defense buffs, but the main problem is he can't be healed by allies, so he needs to stand on his own for a very long time. Next we have Aveline. She is a similar reasoning, you just don't really need weak defenders. She has no faction, she has no awakening, she has you know, some AoE damage, and she can stun some blocked enemies for a second. She can increase her defense, so she doesn't really do anything. She has no faction, she has no awakening, she can stun people a bit, she can do a bit of damage, but again, she's a defender. She's not really going to be doing damage. And then next up we have Bruno. Bruno could arguably be a higher tier. I have seen people use him in some of the later game content. He may be useful for you if you are looking for faction trials. So maybe he belongs to the D tier. I'll see what the feedback is. I'll be updating the tiers based on feedback. And I'll probably try to do a video once a month on tier lists. But just covering the updates and changes. I won't go over every hero again unless they've moved. Harpoon again has some very niche usefulness. He doesn't have the long range attack. He belongs to the North faction. He is also a marksman. He does have awakenings. The main gimmick with Harpoon lies around his awakening free. Where if he kills an enemy with his arrow bombardment ultimate. He gains 80 rage back. But really you would rather build other heroes. He doesn't really do enough. He just kind of tries to kill through enemies quickly using his arrow bombardment. But it's not really enough. Again there are better marksmen out there. Next up we have Soleil. She belongs to the Watcher and the Infernal faction. She's kind of just a single target nuker that can bounce her attacks around a bit. It's just not particularly strong. She has some awakenings that can help her bounce. That can help her do a bit more damage faster. And reduce the cooldowns but it's not really enough i've heard people have some success with her in tide but again these are very end game players i just don't think it's worth the risk really to invest so much resources especially if you're new she's just not a particularly strong mage there are a bunch of other single target mages that are also epic that are a lot better nazim is quite an interesting mage he belongs to the esotericist it appears his entire gimmick is that he can summon a magic blade and if he hits enemies five times he can stun them maybe there'll be content in the future where that's useful but right now it's just weirdly really weirdly niche he can heal allies as well a bit but unfortunately he just i don't really see a place where you need that kind of thing to happen so right now at the moment i would say he's, he's pretty trash next up we have i a mage for the esoterasis faction she is a control focused mage but everything I've heard about her is pretty negative. I've never seen one built to any effect and I've just heard basically bad things about her. If you look at her kit it just seems to be quite inconsistent as to how it works. It takes too long for her to achieve what she's supposed to do when everyone has access to Mary, who is way more consistent for slows and for her ultimate freezing people. Next up we have a siren. I really like this guy's model. I think he looks really cool. He is a mage for the curse faction. Unfortunately, you can see his attack range is not great to start with. I think it improves when you promote him. But one of the biggest issues I have with him is a cost of 25, which is really high. For an epic mage, it doesn't really do enough damage. You can use him. He might be okay. It's just he's so expensive for a mage. There are a lot of better mages out there. Next up, we have Selkath, another mage belonging to the Esoterracist faction. There seems to be a lot of focus on this faction recently. So maybe they'll get some reworks and buffs. He is basically a single target mage that bounces around enchanted bubbles. So at the moment, Selkath is not great, though perhaps in future there'll be more opportunities for him to shine. I just don't see it with his current kit. Next up, we have Nissau, another mage from the Esoterasis faction. His cost is 18, which is not too high, but it's not particularly low. As you can see, he's dependent on building these, on producing these magic vials based on different seconds, and then he can throw them out. So I think there's a lot of downtime and there's a reset period on his alchemy and how many vials he can produce it's just i think he's probably too unreliable to be useful currently though perhaps there is potential for him in future again focusing around poison or burning teams we have Cyrene. she is a fighter belonging to the watcher and the curse faction once again she previously belonged to the ranger faction which is now removed and she has a way of generating costs personally i prefer to use dalin Cyrene can fulfill the same niche as Dalin in the star tier, so perhaps you can get away with it. If you have the two, I would recommend Dalin over Cyrene though. We will now move on to the D tier, Azhor. He is the new defender for the Nightmare faction. He was the previous shard fusion hero before Selene. So I thought he might have potential because I thought, okay, he can boost attack. That's quite useful. That's kind of what you're after from a defender is to provide benefits to the rest of your allies and not just focus on being tanky. The problem is it's just not reliable enough. He has to have his armor up and he needs to be in the heated state in order to generate these boosts. And they're also random who they get applied to. And they only last for 10 seconds. It's just too much things that need to line up for it to be useful. And outside of fortifying sparks, fulfilling all those conditions, 
He doesn't really do anything. I would prefer if he wasn't limited, if they reintroduced him to the pool and buffed him a bit, I think that would be more fun. But at the moment, I don't rate Azhor at all. Next up, and perhaps unfairly, I have Selene, the, the newest fusion shard hero that just came out for the Esotericist faction. She is a fighter. She and I think in order to get her to shine, you need to max skill her ultimate to get the skill cost reduction as 200 off of 500 is a huge drop in skill cost, but it is so expensive to do so. And simply because of how expensive it would be to build her properly and to give her a, a real showing, I just don't really recommend building her. Legendary skill crystals are really hard to come by and there are a lot of heroes that really need the skill ups to shine. She is competing against nightmare fighters who have an incredible faction lead who are very dominant in guild boss and who everyone gains wrath on the 14 day login so she's really not in the right faction to compete as a fighter especially one that offers no debuffs and offers no buffs she just doesn't really do enough to warrant investing in and that's why i put her at d tier the investment required for to build her i think it just isn't worth it so maybe it's a bit unfair maybe she should be in c tier instead we'll see what people say after this video i'm also planning to do a review of her tomorrow so we'll see how that goes Next up, we have the epic heroes in the D tier. We have Fighter from the Nightmare Faction. I actually quite like Gluttony. I used him a lot when I was progressing through the game, but there are a lot of better fighters out there. He does belong to the Nightmare Faction, which is a very nice boost. He can definitely go quite far. He's quite tanky as fighters go. He's basically a epic version of Abomination, so he's a big step down from Abomination, but they kind of fulfill the similar thing. Fighters that can do damage, that can also tank. Uh, and Gluttony has the added boost of being able to stun a bit. So he's not awful. He's definitely quite a useful hero to have early game. But he gets outshone quite quickly. Next up we have Komodo. He is another fighter from the Nightmare faction. Generally he is not a fantastic hero because he's kind of squishy. He hits twice. When he ultimates he gets some attack speed and he can inflict bleed. And he has a passive allowing him to sometimes deal bonus damage. So pretty simple hero. He can apply bleed which is really the only thing that makes him useful. Mainly people can use him in bleed teams predominantly for guild boss alongside Salazar to allow Salazar to have guaranteed crits on many of his attacks and also for the artifact. There is an artifact called Scarlet Hunt. It is a myth artifact and it, when not upgraded it provides 20% increased damage to targets with bleeding up to 30% at max level as you can see here. Komodo can guarantee a bleed at a certain time when you need it most so he does have some niche usefulness but that is very end game that requires myth artifacts that requires a bunch of setup. It's so specific and so niche. Next up we have Ayn. He is a faction lord for the Watcher. So he can grant 10% stat boost and he can periodically heal as well randomly. He is a two tile attacker which is very useful and he is a fighter. He's just quite weak. As fighters go he doesn't really do a lot of damage. He is kind of built to support another fighter in front of him or another defender. But since he's focusing on these kind of damage increasing buffs, you'd probably want to put a fighter in front of him to make them shine and to increase, increase their damage output. And the shielding he can provide manually would be quite helpful. So I think if you're progressing the game, you're quite early, you might get some usefulness out of Iron. But he's not really going to last very far into late games. The next up we have Livian. She is a fusion defender. She belongs to the Watcher and the Piercer faction. She is actually really good. She is one of the better defenders in the game. The only reason she is a D tier list is because you don't need many defenders. Once again, you need one or two of them. So I just can't recommend defenders too ardently because you need so few of them. However, if you have Livian and you don't have other epic defenders, she is great. She will do you fine. But again, you don't need many of these guys. Livian was the defender that I used all the way until I pulled Captain Reeve, my first legendary defender. She did a pretty good job throughout. You can even use Rex, the rare defender, for a lot of content. Defenders, the requirement is just so low. The bar is so low that I don't really think that they're necessarily worth focusing on too much. Again, don't even bother six-starring her. Next, we have Mariel, a watcher defender once again. This time she scales on defense and she has the ability to heal allies as well. And yeah, that's quite good. It's pretty decent. I like the healing. I like the scaling on defense. I prefer Livian personally for the stun and for the self-heal. But Meryl is also a very good defender to have. Once again, she is only a D tier because she is a defender and because you don't need to go crazy with defenders in this game and because the building requirements aren't particularly high. Next up, we have Ardef, another defender, this time from the Esoterasis faction. So the defense, the, ma the magic reduction is very useful to have, especially for stuff like Gear Raid 1. He does some damage, which is nice, and he has some self-sustain. In my opinion, the best defenders are ones that do more than just survive. So Ardef is definitely a decent option as far as epic defenders go. And yeah, you, you could use him in a lot of content. Again, he's not going to be great end game. And again, you don't need many defenders, but he's a decent defender. 
Next we have Tariel. She belongs to the Watcher, the Piercer, and she is a Marksman. She has pretty average attack range for Marksman. The reason I put her down this low is there are some very good Marksmen to build, and Tariel just doesn't really have enough in her kit. She does some okay shot damage, it's not great. And she has a passive which is kind of strange but not great. And then her ultimate is very niche and specific and not really required if you're careful with your placements. Next up we have Tazira. I really, really want to like Tazira. She's another marksman from the Piercer faction. Again, only 11 cost. The problem with her is that her passive increases her attack speed for every enemy within the attack range. And her ultimate just shoots single targets but rapidly. So you want more enemies to shoot, but then when there's more enemies, she's only really shooting one at a time anyway, and it's just not... I prefer people who do proper AoE damage. It's annoying that she scales in this way. I think she can be decent, but especially considering she's only in the Piercer faction, there are better Piercer marksmen. Next up, we have Nalvarus. You could argue, and I've seen some people say that he belongs in the C tier. He belongs to... He is a Nightmare and Esoterrorist Mage. He has average casting range. It's actually quite good damage output, quite decent potential. He belongs to two pretty decent factions as well, especially Nightmare being able to be part of the Nightmare faction, which is predominantly just fighters, is quite strong. The reason he is this far down is he just doesn't quite do enough to outshine some of the C, B, A tier ma mages. Raiden is the faction lord for the Esoterracist. He is also a mage. He has pretty standard range, but not great. I think it will upgrade to one tile extra. And you can see his faction benefit is quite good. Skill cost minus 20%. So just for this, maybe he should be C tier. I'll, I'll wait to see feedback on this one. He doesn't apply any debuffs. He doesn't apply any buffs. He just does AOE damage, but he does have a good Lord benefit, especially for the growing Esoterasis faction. But just because he doesn't do a great deal of AOE damage and because he has a 25 cost, I don't really think he's great. Azoff is an infernal mage. He is of normal attack range again. He has a fairly reasonable cost. He just does single target nuke damage. He is a pretty decent single target nuker, but it's just not great. It's not high enough to really justify him over some of the better single target mages. As you can see, he doesn't boost allies and he doesn't debuff enemies. It's not strong enough, really. Next, we have Midan, a healer for the North faction. I think she probably could have been C tier, so maybe I'll look at revising this. She has reasonable AoE healing. She's pretty good, actually, as things go, but she doesn't have a bunch of utility. Her healing isn't especially strong. She's just a fairly solid AoE healer to have, but I don't think she shines especially hard. But again, she's a pretty solid AoE healer, so I'll look at revising this one potentially. Then next up, we have Lightlock. He is a fusible healer. He belongs to the Watcher and the North faction. He is a single target healer. As you can see, a pretty high single target heal. And he has an ultimate, which is auto cast, which is also the same size heal, but it also does splash damage around the person healed to 50% of his attack. So he scales an attack and he has a nuke based on his attack. So he can actually do pretty decent damage. So he has some decent potential. He's a pretty good single target healer and he has some damage possibilities as well. So that's quite nice to have. Next up, we are moving on to the C tier heroes. C tier means that they're pretty good and they fulfill a position quite well, but there are heroes that fulfill that same position better or are more versatile on top of fulfilling that same position. So they're definitely heroes that are worth building. They definitely are very useful and very powerful to have. It's just they're not the best is all. So first up we have Shamir. He is the legendary mage for the North faction. He focuses on control as you can see. When he hits people with his basic attack, which is a single target attack, he slows them for 4 seconds by 25%. You may remember this is worse than Mary. Mary actually slows more than Shamir does. This is the slow effect that we talked about, 25% slow, and it can stack and each stack increases the damage he deals to the target. The wording isn't great, but I've tested this. Unfortunately, it's just the damage that he deals. I have tested him with absolutely crazy amounts of attack speed, and it's still not enough to get him to apply it more than one stack at a time with his basic attack. So these stacks are only going to be stacking up when his ultimate is activated, and his ultimate is actually pretty crap. It takes a long time to cast, and by that point, a lot of enemies have moved on. Because of how janky and slow and weird his ultimate is, the reason why Shamir is at C tier and not lower is he is still a legendary. Legendaries have really high base stats, so he's still going to do decent-ish damage for a single target mage, and he will also apply some CC effects, and he'll gain more damage at the stacking, so he's not awful. He can still do stuff. He definitely belongs at best at C tier. Next up, we have Regulus. He is the legendary defender belonging to the Watcher faction, and... Yeah, he's at C tier because mainly he's a defender. Defenders aren't fantastic. They don't do damage. They typically don't do great CC. They typically don't do many buffs or debuffs. 
So he's useful mainly for being able to share damage and mainly for the, in the invincibility window he gets from Lionheart. He is especially useful right now in gear raid to levels 19 to 21. But if you've pulled him and you're progressing through the game, he is very good generally for a defender. He has, of course, free block as all defenders do, which is very useful in a lot of campaign missions. And he can help out quite a bit in some of the gear raids just by being tanky. Gear raid 1 and 2, obviously, free as they're all airborne. Next, we have Deimos. He is a very powerful fighter, despite having no faction and no awakening. This is largely due to his basic attack scaling off of his max HP, his ultimate increasing his max HP attack and defense, and his passive tearing, which increases his attack on the same target by 20% up to 6 times. So stacking quite high there, 120% stack, lasting for 10 seconds, but resets on switching target. He is still used a lot in Guild Boss. He was recently nerfed, which is why I've put him down to C tier, but he is still very strong. When he gets a faction and he gets Awakenings, he's probably going to return to being one of the strongest epics in the game. He probably still even is one of the strongest epic heroes in the game, but the reason why I put him at C tier is he simply focuses on single target damage, and while that might make him one of the best fighters for Guild Boss, he is factionless, so it kind of is hard to use him alongside a, a, a Nightmare team, which is quite common. Guild Boss isn't everything. That is only one part of the game, and it doesn't really give you much return. If you are a player and you're looking to progress in other content as well, then he is more limited in gear raids, for example. He's obviously going to be quite good in campaign, but in general, a lot of epic fighters in this tier and, and above are going to have a bit more utility to them, are going to be in factions, and are going to have some other cool stuff that they can do. The next fighter we have is Janqua. He belongs to the Esoterrasist faction. He hits one tile in front of him. When enemies reach him, he curses them. For five seconds, they cannot attack, which is quite nice. But this does not refresh. When they reach him, five seconds of curse, and then it fades, and then they can attack. But it's quite a nice 5 second window where they can't attack him. The main reason I rate him is because the heavy attack is quite strong. Strength of Sphinx, his ultimate, is quite strong. Attacking two enemies is really nice for a fighter. Blocking is quite nice. I think it's just generally quite a good kit for players looking to advance in the campaign. I think it will probably be quite useful in Gear Raid 1 and 2 as well, potentially, but not crazy good. End game content, not so much, but... Because of how unique it is, I think future content may be quite good for him. Scorch is a fighter belonging to the Infernal faction. He also attacks two tiles, but this time it is fully AoE, always two tiles. Three times each time dealing 85%, so that's huge damage. It's magic damage, so it's bonus damage against heavy armor of 20%. It's AoE, and it's two tiles. It's a really, really good basic attack. His ultimate simply increases his attack for a duration. And he has a passive which is just increases his attack as well. So as you can see, all he does is breathe fire. He is just Godzilla. He breathes fire. It does damage. It's AoE. It's magic. It's pretty good. That's all you need. He just does damage. He is fantastic to put behind defenders, fighters, etc. So definitely rate Scorch. He can be used in Gear Raid 1 very well. He can be used in Gear Raid 2, but it's not really his area. He's very good in campaign. And he is not particularly great in Guild Boss. But generally, a great progression hero, definitely worth building if you have him and you're looking at what fighters to take. Next we have Vorov, another fighter, this time from the North faction, and he has a 15% chance to land another attack on his basic attack. So he just attacks really fast and really rapidly, applying many attacks. Personally, I think a lot of that comes down to being highly awakened. I think you can use him in quite a bunch of places. He is typically quite highly rated, but I, the reason I didn't put him higher is I don't think he, I think his kit is kind of limited. He's not really applying debuffs. He's not applying buffs to allies. He's just doing some damage. And yeah, I think it relies on awakenings to really shine. But he is definitely a strong fighter to have. Very well worth building if you're progressing through the game. Olag is one of the better defenders in the game. However, the reason he isn't higher is a lot of it hitches on his awakenings, as we'll go over now. He's a defender belonging to the North faction, but incredibly tanky hero. Remember that I said that defenders being tanky isn't enough to really justify it. They're already quite tanky. Well, I think it's slightly different, mainly because his awakening 5... So you can see he's also boosting his allies' defensiveness, which can be quite useful for the gear raid 2, 19 onwards. So I think he has a lot of potential usefulness just outside of his unbreakable state. Applying physical damage reduction to allies is really nice to have as well, as well as being basically indestructible with his silver shield stacking and his unbreakable. A very tanky defender to have, but for some reason incredibly rare to pause. As you can see there's only a few reviews. If you've got him, congrats. Definitely worth building him. Very, very good defender to have. Next up, we have Isolde. She is a defender for the North Faction. She's also the Faction Lord. So 10% stat boost to North Faction members, as well as a shield that can periodically be placed equivalent to max hp on allied 
faction members. So quite niche, but quite useful faction benefit, especially for the Gear Raid 2 again, where a lot of stuff is really starting to shine because the focus so much is on defensiveness as well as making allies survive, not just defenders. Basically, she can apply shields to the allies next to her. She's pretty tanky herself. She can increase the damage reduction of allies next to her. Very good for Gear Raid 2. The first one is the important one to get hold of. So a very good defender to build if you've got her, congrats. I would definitely recommend building her and she's quite good for Gear Raid 2 later on as well. Next up we have Baron, again one of the best defenders in the game, he belongs to the Nightmare faction, he's not a lord, the reason he is good is he has a high shield, he has an undying state and he deals AoE damage. I personally think he's probably better than Regulus for most content just because he has the ability to deal damage which as a newer player is going to be really important for you but Regulus does have the ability to shield allies and reduce the damage they take which is very important. Next up we have Brienne, she is a marksman belonging to the Watcher and the Piercer factions, pretty standard attack range as normal, really really good ultimate, multi shot is really what makes Brienne worth it, she just feathers down an entire wave of enemies, 5 enemies at a time shooting 6 waves, uh, bonus damage on each shot, it's just a lot of damage, if you do the math it's like 720% AoE damage to 5 enemies, that's, that's a lot of damage over 4 seconds, especially for an epic, especially for a marksman. I found her incredibly viable, really good in arena, really good in campaign, great in gear raid 3 and even usable in gear raid 1 and sometimes in gear raid 2 if you're progressing. So a really good character to have, one of the first characters I 6 starred and she helped me a lot when I was progressing. Maul is another marksman, this time belonging to the north faction and he has a slightly better attack range, increasing this out one tile in the middle when he is promoted. His basic attack deals AoE damage to multiple targets but it is a very slow attack interval, you can see at 3.5 seconds comparable to someone like Brienne whose interval is two seconds he's attacking significantly slower than her but it does have AoE splash damage on it which is quite useful in its own way but it's so slow that his DPS from his auto attack is quite low it's noticeably lower than other epic marksmen like Brienne the main reason you use him is this ultimate abyssal surge pretty low rage cap of 600 and you can see you can reduce it down to 500 at max skill it does 750% AoE damage this can be increased up to 870% AoE damage at max skill, knocking back one strength. You don't really care about the knockback, it's an 820% damage nuke on a low cooldown, that's really really good, it's very powerful for gear raid 1, for gear raid 2 even sometimes, and for gear raid 3 especially. I still use him in gear raid 3 and he is one of the fastest clearers because his armor can reach very far, the range on this thing is very big. Next up we have another marksman, this time it is Fearwin, belonging to the Piercer faction. He only has an 11 cost, same as Brienne and same as many other marksmen. He is also a fusible hero so everyone can get him. He was recently nerfed slightly but I still think he is very good. Mainly he is there for his AoE damage. It's actually really quite strong. You still see him in endgame arena on the airborne day for the massive slow and for the pretty consistent AoE damage. Just a very solid AoE marksman dealing good damage and offering good CC potential. Iona is a mage belonging to the Watcher and the Curse faction. She has a fairly standard attack range, it's not particularly long. Huge amount of uptime on her attack speed boost, she does lots of AoE damage and she does have some slows as well. She is one of the best epic mages in the game, she will help you a lot in gear raid 1 especially, so a very very good mage to pull, one of the best AoE mages in the game, especially amongst the epic tier. And you can also see that all three of her awakening milestones, 1, 3 and 5 are pretty strong. And I don't look at 2 and 4 too much because these are always going to be just stat boosts, they tend to be quite good, but 1, 2 and 3 are the important ones to check. Imani is another mage, this time from the infernal faction, she is a single target nuka and also she is an infernal member so if you have a pyros or twin fiend then you can get these boosts meaning that when they use their ultimate you increase penetration which is ignoring defense so she does massive damage to targets when those are up and really that's where she shines is being used alongside the lords especially in guild boss where she can do really high damage in conjunction with the infernal lords. Outside of that she is a solid single target nuka mage for when you need to kill stuff first. Next we have Aeon, she is the epic lord for the curse faction, she is also a mage. She has a pretty good attack range and she can attack behind her as well for one row but she focuses on control and debuffs. The main reason I really think she's a solid hero is because she is an epic lord of the cursed cult. The cursed cult is a very important faction, a very good lord to have and she also applies debuffs so a great ninth or 10th hero to use and you can build her and place her as well because of the debuff she's applying as well as the CC so very solid hero. 
Next we have Vortex. He is a healer from the North faction. Very big cast range on his heal. And you can see he heals based on his max HP. Most healers scale on attack. Him scaling on HP is quite nice. It makes it easier to gear multiple healers because he's not demanding the same gear as them. And it also means that he is very tanky. Scaling on attack for a healer only increases their healing, right? They're not going to be doing any damage unless they're light lock. Scaling on HP, so very tanky. He's great to use in gear raid 2 where you want shielding and where you want tanky healers because it's very easy for healers to die in gear raid 2 with the AoE damage which is pervasive and hits everyone. Vortex being able to be tanky as well as providing shields, he is very ideal for that content. For the final hero in the C tier, we have Nisande. She is another healer, this time for the Piercer faction. She doesn't have any talents, she heals based on her attack, scaling the same as other ones such as Lightlock, single target, pretty good hero, good for attack boost, used to be used a lot in guild boss though, was nerfed a bit and now you don't see her as much and she has been replaced with another healer that will go over later, Hollow. But generally a pretty solid epic healer, very high single target heals as well as being able to bounce them with her ultimate activated as well as having a burst heal on her ultimate and providing attack boost which is really useful as again most of this game focuses on damage output. So we will start looking into the B tier now. Just to reiterate, B tier heroes are great. They are very useful. Either they shine in a bunch of areas or they're particularly good in a specific area. Typically they are not the best in slot for that area, but they are very good and very versatile. But they're not like the best in that area. There's typically another hero that performs a bit better in the same role as them, but they are still very, very good heroes and very worth building. So to start things off, we have Araka, the legendary piercer lord. She is a fighter. She has a uniquely long attack range, as you can see, she hits the adjacent tiles in front of her, as well as one more forward. She can actually hit airborne targets as a fighter, which is really nice. She has some good control, some good debuffs, some good damage, good range. She can attack airborne, so very versatile, being able to attack in multiple tiles around her, attacking two tiles at a time and hitting airborne. It's a really nice gathering of abilities there, a lot of utility, a lot of usefulness. A lot of content she'll be great in, progression she'll be great, pretty much all of the gear raid she'll be useful but especially gear raid 3 she will really shine there. And one of the reasons she is incredible is her lord benefit, remember she is the first legendary lord we're looking at so she has free benefits. 10% stat boost, increases the attack range of all faction members and again look at all the marksmen in this tier. You have Brienne, you have Fiowin, there's some really good marksmen and not to mention the legendary ones as well. Calypso and Nyx and she also has two healers in this Lily and Nisande increasing their healing range so very powerful to do that generally a very solid hero not the best damage output quite low compared to some other legendary fighters but a very good lord benefit and very versatile in what she can do and applying some good debuffs next up we have Valkyria she attacks three tiles forward which is really nice for a fighter a few of them do this but not many she belongs to the north faction she does not attack airborne, I believe, but she does apply magic vulnerability on hit. Magic damage taken is increased by 15%. And this does not have a duration, by the way. This lasts until they die, or in the guild boss's case, until it wipes it off of itself with the shielding phases. So very powerful debuff to apply there, especially considering this pierces AoE. All targets in range are getting this debuff until they die. Really useful for gear raid 1. So she has three tiles in front of her. If anyone dies in three tiles in front of her, she will revive them instantly, only once per combat. Useful somewhere like Gear Raid 2 especially, and generally nice utility to have. The kind of thing that may shine a lot in future content, so one to keep in mind. Her Awakening 1 increases her attack range again, so up to four tiles in front, which is very nice. A very solid fighter to have. She deals pretty decent damage, she deals AoE damage, she applies a very good debuff, she has a long cast range. And she can revive allies, so generally a very solid fighter, definitely worth building. Volka, I have a guide video on, I would recommend her. You get her from completing the Storyline Quest series, and she is a fighter for the Nightmare faction. Though again, I suspect she will get her own faction in future, though there has been no confirmation or even any hints at that happening, it's just my personal belief. She hits a single target in front of her. She can stack this, she gains stacks of Scarlet for men, increasing her attack and defense. She attacks up to three targets with her basic attack, which is quite nice. Really, this is what she's for. 20% vulnerability to damage is really good. This is quite good in guild boss, especially for some early teams where you don't have full faction teams ready to go. But even still, she belongs to the Nightmare faction. So using Wrath, who you also get by default from login, you're increasing every other Nightmare faction's attack speed by quite a lot. So very good to have her down. She does okay damage in really good gear. I have mine geared up pretty good. And she's doing fairly decent damage in guild boss, but it is significantly less than the other legendary DPS that I have. The reason I use her is because she has a really good ultimate, she adds self-sustain, and she's part of Nightmare Faction to help apply 
the attack speed boost so she's not a very high damage dealer she just applies very good debuffs and she provides self-sustain to the rest of the team so next up we have ajax he is a mage belonging to the unnameable faction the only hero of this faction the unique thing about this faction is that they can be placed in any faction team and they will get the benefits so he can be used in nightmare teams infernal teams curse teams especially are probably ideal for him as he does aoe magic damage and he will get their benefits he also looks really cool but anyway he's just a great aoe damage hero massive damage coming out from him really high aoe damage mage some people may wonder why he's in b tier below the other aoe mages really it's because he's been power crept to be honest with you there have been new aoe mages that have been introduced in recent months that are just a lot stronger than him that have a lot more burst potential than him and a lot more kill potential than him but ajax still does good damage he does high aoe damage and the unnameable faction cannot be stated enough it is really strong next we have nocturne he is a mage belonging to both the north and the infernal faction he is probably the highest damaging mage single target nuker in the game he does massive amounts of damage and he is one of the best guild boss heroes to use and that's really what pulls him up this high in the list He's got to be great in a bunch of content, really nice attack range with his ultimate activated, really high single target damage, but for a lot of content that's not necessary. Pretty much all of the gear raids, you don't need that, though it can be helpful in gear raid 2 for example to kill some of the enemies quickly, and in gear raid 3 because it is high damage and he can hit aerial, but in gear raid 1 he doesn't do any AoE damage so that's not particularly useful. He will be great in campaign progression just because it's a lot of damage and this game kind of requires damage but mainly he shines in guild boss and also he'll be good for faction trials because he can be used in two at the moment not a lot of content requires a crazy amount of single target attack but guild boss does and that's one of the more difficult content so just for that he's very good almost unmatched especially as mages go next up we have twin fiend he is a mage and he is the lord of the infernal faction he has a pretty standard casting range mainly he is there for his ultimate mainly he is there for focus fire you definitely want to use him for his infernal lord benefit granting 20 percent crit rate 20, 30 percent crit damage 30 percent penetration of all defenses for 10 seconds when he ultimates is very powerful and additionally his awakening one is very good targets marked with his ultimate skill will get vulnerability to physical and magic damage up to 25 percent which is huge awakening one on twin fiend is a really big deal very good hero to get very good in guild boss he has some aoe damage potential he has some single target damage potential and yeah great lord for a very very powerful faction next we have zealous he is a mage for the curse faction doesn't have a talent he is an aoe mage his basic attacks throw ground effects down i have a video on him that's quite old now but it showcased how he helped me a lot in gear raid one is very expensive to place at 29 one of the highest in the game so you can't really use him much in campaign i got him very early and barely used him just because of how expensive he is and something else to keep in mind is his last passive soul corruption means that his ground effects apply magic vulnerability increases the damage enemies take by 10 to 14 percent from magic damage and this is applied all the time it's his magic the it's his auto attack so he's always applying these effects so very potent very useful there he just does aoe damage and he applies a very good debuff he's also part of the curse faction so using him with Nero and slowing the enemies will help him deal more damage to them. He's not that strong as far as AoE mages go compared to someone like Ajax I would say he is better. But the he is pretty good. He applies good debuffs. He has very good range. He's a solid AoE mage for sure. Next we have Nyx. She's a legendary marksman for the Piercer faction. She doesn't have any talent. She has a very long attack range going out by another tile. She is not really highly regarded as far as legendaries go. A lot of people rated her very lowly before. However she's been buffed recently. Her cost has been reduced from 25 to 22 and she's had some modifier tweaks. She is actually quite decent. The main thing I like about her, she has a very long attack range. She also does AoE damage, which is quite nice for a marksman. So I, I think Nyx is definitely improving and is quite a nice AoE hero. She's good in gear raid 1 and gear raid 3. And in my opinion, gear raids are the most important content in the game. And then the last legendaries in the B tier are defenders. So first up, we have King Haas. He is a defender for the North faction and he is also the legendary lord. So 10% stat gain as well as providing shields to allies that are faction members and not faction members. And also shielded members get 20% defense increase. So very tanky. He has a 20% chance to freeze enemies with his attack for 4 seconds. So a long freeze there. And his legendary lord effects are very good as well. He is just a very strong defender. Lots of freeze which is really nice CC. Lots of very good shields and a great faction buff. So very very good defender to have exceedingly rare to pull for some reason again fishiness going on with lords in this game only two reviews next up we have captain reeve he is a defender for the curse faction he was a limited hero available during a halloween event and unfortunately is not in the summon pool anymore 
Of all the limited heroes in the game, I think Captain Reaver is one of the best, if not the best. Very nice hero, self-sustain, AoE damage, AoE stun. The only reason I didn't put him higher is mainly because he's not a lord. King Haas is a lord and that makes him very powerful. Captain Reaver isn't a lord and he's not especially tanky. If you take note, none of his abilities make him tankier. He just does damage, he slows a bit, he stuns a bit, right? Typically, if you want to do damage, you take a fighter. If you want to CC, you can take a focused CC like Mary. Reeve is just generally a very good progression hero. He's great for crushing through campaign. He is great in so many campaign stages. And again, bear in mind, most content, you don't need to be extra tanky. You don't need Regulus's passives to survive. So Captain Reeve doesn't die anyway. He is my main tank. I use him in pretty much any content where I need a defender because he's tanky enough just on the base stats of being a legendary defender. He holds his own and does pretty good damage as well. I've built him to be more aggressive as have other players on my servers and we have a lot of success just dealing damage with him. But again, he is not a legendary lord. He doesn't have any utility to help allies out by buffing them in any way or making them more tanky. Quite a selfish defender. He doesn't help allies out. He doesn't have any boosts to survivability for those kind of like gear raid 2 stages. He does damage, but the damage is not going to compete with a full-fledged DPS. But saying that, he is still incredibly good for how much damage and stun he does, for it being AoE, for being part of a very good faction, and for being a defender, so he's very tanky on top of all that. A very, very, very good hero, very versatile. He's kind of like a jack of all trades. Next up, we have Raph. He is a fighter. He is an epic lord for the Nightmare faction, and you get him for free on your 14-day login. He is definitely one of the strongest epics in the game. Some people could argue him to be A-tier, and I don't entirely disagree. His faction benefits are great for Nightmare faction. 10% stat boost, attack speed gain, stacking 5, 10, 20 to 35% attack speed gain. Of course, allies that are in the faction lose 20% healing, but that's fine. Nightmare guys are all pretty much tanky. They all have self-sustain to some degree. He does massive damage considering he is an epic. Some of the other things that make Raph really good are his awakenings. This one guarantees that his Soul Basher will crit. The third one inflicts burning on his heavy blows AoE attack. And the fifth one, which is my favorite, gives him 30% self-heal of the damage he deals with heavy blow, which basically means that he can self-sustain. He doesn't need a healer. I leave him on guild boss frequently outside of Dolores' heal, and he can stay alive by himself without any healer. He is great in campaign, especially in the final two chapters, for holding off lanes by himself without any healers, especially the final chapter. So Raph is one of the best heroes in the game, in my opinion. Definitely one of the best epics in the game. He has a lot of power, a lot of damage, he has AoE potential, he has self-sustained potential at Awakening 5. He is very easy to build with the critical rate that he grants. He can just churn through attacks really fast with all these extra attacks that he gets. So, very high damage hero, very good in guild boss, very good faction, very good epic benefits to his faction. Very good awakenings, generally a really, really good hero to use, definitely recommend him. Estrid is a fighter for the North faction. 10 up to 30% defense reduction. I don't know why it says damage minus 10%. I think it should say defense. But it's up to 30% defense reduction on enemies. She deals pretty good damage, hitting an AoE for 15 seconds. Quite a lot of AoE damage. Lots of benefits from skill ups on her blade storm. Her Awakening 1 increases her attack range, so she now becomes a two-tile attacker, which is always good to have. Awakening 3, her defense debuff becomes permanent. That is really good, especially for Guild Boss. Permanently reducing the guild boss's defense by 30% would be really, really good. But generally, she is there for solid damage and for her defense reduction. You could argue that she is not quite B tier when you're comparing to people like Raph, but it's very strong to have. She's a very good fighter, very good damage output, but probably one of the weaker ones in this tier. Though saying that, it is a very, very powerful debuff, and having it last indefinitely is very good as well. So, strong fighter, good damage output, great debuff. Lunaria is a epic. Lord for the Piercer faction and a Marksman. She was a fusion event last year. I missed that fusion event, unfortunately. A whole bunch of people have fused her and I haven't seen her pulled since then. Though it does say she is in a summon pool, but once again, it is the shenanigans with summons regarding Lords, in my opinion. So hopefully we see something about that soon. She is very good. She triggers these Dark Moon arrows that deal massive bonus magic damage. So as you can see, she is a single target nuker, a marksman that does massive single target damage, and it is magic damage on top of that. Lunaria is great in a lot of content. You do see her in Guild Boss. She'll be great in Gear Raid 3. You can probably use her in Gear Raid 2. 
Because of her Lord benefit affecting so many great heroes, she grants the attack range even at the epic level, so she would still be beneficial for the healers. So there's a lot of benefits from the epic Lord benefit here for the piercer faction and massive single target nuke damage. So definitely a great hero, massive damage output potential. Next we have Pyros, he is the Infernal Faction Lord. We discussed Twin Fiend in the same tier, they both are B tier. Though I have heard people say that Pyros is actually better, strangely. I think this is because Twin Fiend needs Awakening 1 to really, really shine. But as you can see, Pyros also afflicts the penetration 30% of all defense for 10 seconds. His ultimate destruction command, very similar to Twin Fiend's meteoric ultimate. And again, focus fire once again. So basically the same kind of stuff as Twin Fiend there, but without the AoE damage. The main difference between the two is Delusional Gaze. Targets marked with destruction command are inflicted with physical vulnerability and magic vulnerability. And the vulnerability increases by 10% up to 20% on each one. So yeah, this is really why you want a Pyros versus an Awaken Zero Twin Fiend. Having these vulnerability debuffs is just crazy good, especially in Guild Boss. You'll see pretty much every top tier guild boss team is using Pyros for this reason. It's just such a strong effect to have. In general, Pyros is a great single target nuker. It has a great faction boost for very, very good heroes. And he does decent damage with a really good ultimate and really good debuffs to apply. Next we have Greed. He is an epic mage for the Nightmare and the Curse faction. He is an AoE damage group controlled focused mage. Mainly he is there because he applies really good debuff and he applies slows. So he does AoE slows, he applies debuffs and he does pretty solid AoE damage as well. Really good awakenings on him. You definitely want to awaken him 5 if you can and he is one of the best AoE mages in the game. Especially from the epic, probably the best epic AoE mage in the game. And very very good for gear raid 1. Probably pretty good for a progression as well. His cost is quite high at 25, but for gear raid 1 that shouldn't matter too much. And last within the B tier we have the healer Hollow for the Curse faction. She has a pretty nice healing range. She is a mono healer so she only heals one person. Again 60% attack, same as Lightlock and same as Nisande. She is used excessively in guild boss at the moment because increasing the rage of her allies, getting their armors up faster, Salazar, Zilla 2, etc. It's really powerful. It's really good to have your allies have their rage come up sooner, and it just provides a lot of benefits in doing that. So Hollow is really good, especially for Guild Boss. She's generally quite a good healer, with strong single target heals, and two targets healed with her ultimate up, and the benefits from the rage cap is quite good as well. You'll find quite a lot of use for her in the gear raids, just because she can be your primary healer, as well as boosting rage regen. So just a solid healer overall, one of the better ones you can use just because she provides stuff outside of just healing. And now we move on to the A tier. These are heroes who are considered to be pretty top tier. They're very, very dominant or they're incredibly versatile. These are heroes who are the best at what they do or they are versatile enough that they're fit in enough roles very well to be worth their place in A. So first up we have Abomination. He is one of my personal favorites. The reason for it is he has the highest base HP in the game, I believe. He is a fighter for the Nightmare faction, so not a defender, with a huge amount of base HP, making him very tanky. He has AoE damage, he has massive HP, damage reduction, attack speed, damage, two tiles. He has his own kind of invincibility window, his own self-sustain healing, really, really good benefits there. So in my opinion, his awakenings aren't too good, but his base kit is just so versatile. He is really tanky. He does really quite good damage, not top tier damage, but he's a defender that's incredibly tanky, that can self-sustain, deal good damage, deal AoE damage, and deal longer range damage. So Abomination has a lot in his kit, gets stronger over time. Moving on, we have Morrigan. Morrigan is a mage. She is the legendary curse lord, and this means that she also grants damage to slowed frozen, immobilized, etc. enemies. 30%, 10% stat boost, really nice. Additionally, she just flat out grants AoE damage dealt by her faction members an additional 25%. That's crazy. 25% more damage on top of 30% from this. So you have some really good AoE mages in here. You have Iona, for example, you have Greed, you have Captain Reef who does a lot, Zealous, you have Vienna. There's just a lot of magic damage dealers in this faction and increasing their damage flat out by 25% is just a crazy benefit to have. She hits three targets at a time and she applies bombs that detonate and leave AoE. So you can see lots of AoE effects, decent damage increase and yeah just generally a lot of AoE damage. It's not the highest AoE damage but it is pretty good. The main reason she's good is her curse benefit, her curse lord is just so strong. That benefit is obviously affecting her as well. So she actually has a lot of damage output. She is fantastic in Arena because of this. On the group days, she is great in Gear Raid 1. You can even use her to some success in Gear Raid 2 and 3. 
she is obviously good in campaign as well and additionally on top of all this she only costs 17 to deploy so morgan is an incredibly powerful aoe mage definitely one of the best in the game you could argue to put her at s tier i may consider it i just want to keep the tier quite slim as you'll see soon but one of the best heroes in the game by miles it's very very strong hero she does good AoE damage, but mainly her, her Cursed Lord benefit, the Legendary Lord, is just insanely good. Next up, we have Karma, a pretty new hero introduced within the last month or two. He is a mage belonging to the Esoterracist faction. He really focuses on just blasting waves of enemies out. The main issue with him is that he relies on his ultimate being active, and it's got such a high rage cap. If his rage cap was lower, he would easily be one of the strongest heroes in the game. And even with it as high as it is, he still does massive damage. It's the ultimate that makes him so strong. I have a video reviewing him if you want to check that out. It does showcase just how powerful this guy is, even when not fully built. So I definitely recommend focusing on Karma. He's one of the best AoE mages in the game. It's unfortunate that he's in the Esoterasis faction and not Curse. However, Venoma, who we'll go over next, does apply skill cost reduction, which can help a lot with someone like Karmet, who has such a high rage cap. And next up, we will talk about Venoma. She is a mage for the Esoterasis faction, and she is the legendary lord for that faction. 10% stat gain, minus 25% skill cost reduction, so again, scaling for high rage cap heroes such as Karmet. And the first time she enters the field, allies gain 30% rage, so you want to place her afterwards, I guess, but it's kind of a niche benefit. I don't think it's that crazy. It will help circumstantially though and the attack bounces to two enemies so this is just spraying out these aoe fields of damage so she's applying lots of curse and she's applying lots of hex and she has an aoe nuke and she has a pretty good faction lord so i think venoma is very strong lots of persistent aoe damage good slow effects she has lots of hex for aoe damage and she has the ability to apply curse so just lots of really good debuffs some really good damage as well and a really good lord on top so she's not the best at any she's not the best damage dealer she's not the best debuffer not the best lord but the conjunction of having it really good in all three is, is actually really potent definitely a very good hero to have and basic attack multi attacking is obviously very good as well so she's i would say she's pretty much great in all content the ability to apply curse is going to help out a lot making enemies unable to attack Obviously she's not going to be particularly great in guild boss because she's an AoE focused target. Outside of that, I think you could use Venoma in most content. She is very, very versatile and has really good lord benefits. Next up we have Setram, the legendary marksman belonging to the Infernal faction. Again, a hero that was introduced fairly recently. You can see he has a very long attack range, which is one of his perks. But one of the things I like about Setram is he is not just a guild boss hero. You have some heroes who are very good, but they're kind of limited to guild boss. I think Nocturne has usage outside of guild boss, but not as much as Setram does. Setram is a monster in guild boss better than Nocturne, but is also more versatile because he has such a crazy attack range. It's just such high damage output from him. Setram was basically built for guild boss is pretty clear, and his first awakening is incredible. Applying a buff to two allies with the highest attack within range, dealing so they deal 30% more damage to enemies with shields for 15 seconds. It's great. Really good awakenings on him. Really high nuking damage on this hero. One of the best nukers in the game. One of the highest attack ranges in the game. You can use him in gear raid 1 weirdly to attack Elowin in gear raid 119 onwards. Which has usage in 19, probably not in 20 and 21. But it's kind of cool that he can do that. So definitely watch out for him in future content. The ability to attack super far ahead is very useful. But generally he is just a monster in guild boss. He'll be very useful in gear raid 3. You can probably use him in gear raid 2 to some success. Not a lot. He'll be good in campaign as well. So yeah, very very strong hero. Very high DPS and very good attack range. Next we have Calypso. She is also a marksman. This time she is of the piercer faction. So she can increase her attack range if you have one of the lords. Has very low cost at only 12 to deploy. She basically just focuses down, powers up over time. And does loads of rapid damage. Loads of rapid instances of attacks. Very high DPS hero. Very very solid outshined by setram in a lot of scenarios but calypso is still very good and has a more consistent uptime she doesn't rely on just her ultimate to deal damage she's constant high damage very good in campaign very good in guild boss especially with a piercer lord and generally pretty good in a lot of content very very good in gear raid free as well so calypso is one of the best marksmen in the game arguably the best competing with setram next we have torador a legendary defender the legendary lord of the nightmare faction one of the best factions in the game the same benefits as Wrath, however additionally, basic attacks of faction members have a 20% chance of dealing additional damage once. You look at all these legendary fighters, so high DPS from these four, and then Wrath has high DPS as well, Hatsa has crazy DPS, and then you give them a 20% chance of dealing additional damage whenever they make a basic attack. Super powerful, massive DPS increase. He has two tile range, 
His attacks inflict defense debuff for five seconds, 20% less defense, which is nice. Mainly his legendary Lord benefits are just crazy good in conjunction with the legendary fighters who are all super, super strong. Really, really good hero. Again, barely anyone has him because he is a legendary Lord, but just such a powerful hero. Applying defense break on attack is really good as well. So he applies good debuffs. He can apply stuns. He can do some decent damage himself. And he's also a very tanky defender with a self revive. It's mainly his legendary lord benefit that makes him so valuable. And the last hero from this tier is Elowin. Elowin is the only pure legendary healer. Gwendolyn is also a legendary healer, but she doesn't really heal. She's super niche in how she applies her shielding. Elowin has a pretty decent casting range for her heals as she heals the row behind her. She belongs to the Esoterasis faction. And she heals for 42% of her attack for free allies in range as opposed to. 60% as the single target healers do so quite nice healing there on three targets at a time Elowin provides the best healing in the game without question she also has the best utility to heal across the map with her elf her forest elves and she also pri provides rage regen so there is just so much in Elowin's kit that makes her powerful she helped me massively through campaign she helps a lot in gear raids I used her a lot in my starting guild boss teams because she also provides rage regen and she heals free at a time so she's very good for that. Not the best in the later teams because the healing requirement gets a bit lower as you get better gear. But generally an incredible progression character, the best healer in the game and has some very good benefits on top of that. She could be argued for S tier. The only reason I haven't put her there is in my mind S tier as we'll go over now is about heroes that are game changing. These are heroes that just provide so much benefit to you that pulling them really changes how your team functions. It, it just changes your game entirely, how much they give you. So to start things off, we have Zillatu. Zillatu is a fighter for the Infernal faction, which when she's promoted, it's actually three tiles forward as well. So it's quite a long attack range. She can hit airborne units with her basic attack, which is nice. Mainly, she is a monster in guild boss. It cannot be stated enough how powerful she is in guild boss. On my server, the highest player is dealing like 100 million damage with her, which is just insanity. I think the highest I do is like 30 million with my Salazar. So Zillatu is just really crazy on how much damage she can pump out. I think it's largely coming from her soul siphoning passive. She is a very high damage dealer. She nukes like crazy on guild boss, uncontestably the highest damage output on guild boss. You can use her pretty much everywhere as she attacks airborne as well. She has good attack range being free forward. When her armor is activated, it's also free wide. So yeah, so much benefit to using her definitely recommend it for guild boss unfortunately you do really want to have a zil uh, a pyros or a twin fiend to help boost her penetration to increase the damage she does as well as the focus fire so yeah zilla 2 is a real beast you definitely want to pull a infernal faction lord as well to support her but she is one of the highest damage dealers in the game definitely the highest single target damage dealer on stuff like the guild boss Guild Boss is not everything though, Zilla 2 is very very powerful in other content as well. You can use her in Gear Raid 2 and 3, she's not great in Gear Raid 1 because she doesn't do AoE damage, but she is pretty good through campaign and through most other content as well, just because of the utility of hitting ground and aerial units and doing so much damage, and yeah, generally just an incredible hero for the damage output she has. I've also put Arrogance at S tier, mainly because he's kind of like Zilla 2, he doesn't do as much damage as Zilla 2 does in single target, he doesn't have the same scaling, he doesn't have the true damage. You can see he is a fighter for the Nightmare faction, so the faction which is slightly easier to use due to Wrath. And he also has the same attack range as her. He can also hit Airborne, he also hits 3 tiles forward, 3 wide when his ultimate is activated. When his ultimate is activated, his blade becomes AoE. In my opinion, this makes him more versatile than even Zilla 2. Zilla 2 outshines him in Guild Boss. Outside of Guild Boss, I think I prefer Arrogance, because he's just so good at everything. You can use him in Gear Raid 1, 2, and 3. He's great AoE damage for Gear Raid 1. He has pretty good damage in gear raid 2, airborne in gear raid 3 as well, and it's all AoE damage. So he is so versatile. AoE damage in all damage formats is crazy, with good attack range on top of it. Arrogance, I think, is kind of underappreciated by a lot of players. I think a lot of people overestimate how valuable guild boss is just because it's hard to get high numbers. Arrogance is useful in so many areas in the game. He's generally just can be used in every single gear raid. He's useful in the basic trial as well. It's just so much utility. He's fantastic in campaign. He helped me clear campaign on expert mode when I got him. So one of my favorite heroes in the game. If I had to start again and take only one hero with me, I would. at the moment I'm leaning towards saying it would be Arrogance, surprisingly. Though there are others that I would definitely consider that we'll probably be going over now. But Arrogance is just such a, a top tier hero for sure. Next up we have Salazar. He was 
I believe he was the third hero I pulled. He propelled me through the game. He is a fighter for the Nightmare faction as well. Single target damage, one tile in front. So you think, ah, that's not too much. Doesn't even have a talent. The main reason you use Salazar is his Slashing Blitz just does a crazy amount of burst damage to a single target. If you add it all up, it comes to like 1,880% damage to a single target in like two seconds. It's just a huge damage burst. It's just such a big burst window. It's, it's probably the highest single target burst in the game. He does bounce around as well, so it's not like you're going to overkill one target and waste it. He'll kill them and move on. And via this ultimate, Salazar can just bounce through and kill a whole bunch of targets in one go. It's such a crazy good ultimate. It does so much damage. On top of that, it lasts for two seconds, and during those two seconds, he is not visible. He has complete invincibility for two seconds. You can use this to duck the guild boss's shield explosion. You can use this to duck different effects in the gear raids. It's just so good. So good for campaign as well. I've used him to bounce on to attack bosses early and kill bosses fast. He obliterates everything. I think the only content I haven't used him in is Airborne. Airborne Arena and Gear Raid 3. That's the only stuff where Salazar doesn't have a place. Because he does so much damage outside of that, he's just great. He's also one of the highest damage dealers in Guild Boss. He's also very easy to put in a team because you get the Nightmare Lead of Wrath very early. And he scales well with attack speed as well. So yeah, Salazar is just really, really strong. Definitely one of the best heroes in the game. Definitely the highest single target nuker in the game. And incredibly versatile just through the sheer audacity of murdering things super fast. And next up we have Hatsu. Hatsu is uncontestably belongs here. She is just incredibly powerful, incredibly versatile, incredibly strong. She is a Nightmare Marksman, so again, you can take advantage of having Wrath for the attack speed boost. She increases the damage. She is not targetable when she is placed, which is really nice. It means that she won't be attacked by certain effects. Even the guild boss's Meteor won't attack her when she's placed like this, I believe. Very good for gear raids for that reason. I think you can use her in very well in gear raid 1, even. You can use her amazingly in gear raid 3, and you can even use her in gear raid 2. Incredibly versatile for that. Some of the stages in the campaign, I had to use her as an assist to beat. I needed her in many of the final chapter in Expert to clear that. There was super hard without her. Being able to delete enemies instantly with her ultimate was just so valuable, as well as being placed without getting targeted for 20 seconds is so good. She's probably one of the, my most desired characters to pull. And back to what I said with Arrogance, with if I could have one character on a new account, Hatsu would definitely be one of those kind of characters I would want to get super early, because she would just dominate. Your account would propel forward. Yeah, she's not great in Guild Boss, but who cares? Guild Boss gives you some great rewards and all, but clearing through the campaign super fast with Hatsu is way more important. And having a hero you can use in every single gear raid is also incredibly important. So absolutely one of the best heroes in the game. Uncontestably powerful in so many ways. And finally in this tier list, this one is probably going to be contested a bit, which I'm okay with. I I'm, I'm willing to change things based on feedback. But from my current opinion, Fiona is the best AoE mage in the game. She belongs to the Curse faction. She applies Mortal Kiss on attack, which does AoE damage on every enemy she attacks. So you know how Morrigan has to detonate bombs and all that stuff to leave these area effects down? Fiona just does it on her basic attack. But the main reason Fiona is insane is her ultimate 700% up to 900% magic damage instantly in a big AoE in front of her. And after that damage is taken... There's a short delay and then enemies with 25 or up to 35% health left are instantly killed. Just dead. And the rage cap isn't that high. 900 down to 800 rage cap. So this is up very often in group arena. This makes her the best hero in the game for group arena because she just instantly kills the waves. It's so hard to compete against the mage that can just instantly kill the enemy waves. It's so powerful, so potent for what it does. It's just hard to deal with. I always use her in group arena and I rarely lose. The only times I lose is usually against a Hatsu or a Vienna or both together. That's probably the most damaging combo you can have. They're just so damaging in AoE. Gear Raid 1, she is a monster. She can clear the thing by herself. Even 19, she does insane work by herself. Just give her a Dolores and she is good to kill half of that thing by herself. If not 90% of the content by herself. She is so strong. Yeah, one of my favorite heroes in the game. She's just super powerful. The ability to cull is really strong. The damage is really high. I use her in Gear Raid 1 excessively. I use her in Gear Raid 3 as well. I use her in two of the arena days. I use her massively in the basic trial. I even actually use her in Guild Boss just because I don't have better heroes. She's actually able to hold her weight in Guild Boss, a single target damage, as an AoE damage hero. Yeah, she's not doing crazy damage. She's not top tier by any means in Guild Boss. But the fact that she can still do nearly 10 million damage by herself is quite impressive, I think. So anyway, that is my tier list. I'll pop the full thing back up now. Um, let me know what you think, if you have any opinions about where things should be moved around. I don't think this is the be-all, end-all correct way of doing it. I just wanted to make a tier list that was more considerate of the different layers. I wanted to showcase 
overall what I think are the better heroes to get and roughly where they stand in relation to each other and to give you a suggestion on what heroes are better to build. I would only say the E tier is one that you should avoid building heroes from. Everything else you can definitely consider building. A lot of heroes in this game are useful and a lot of them have utility in a lot of different places. It's just that the heroes in the S down to C tier are a lot more versatile especially S to B tier are all worth building. They're all very very good but C and D tier also have their place. So we'll see where things go. In future, I will update and make a new video going over changes and movements to where things are in the list. Hopefully I'll see you again for that one. Thank you very much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, please do subscribe and I'll see you again in the next one. Take care guys, bye-bye.